Please welcome, please welcome. Welcome. This is another episode of the Defenders of Business Value podcast, a podcast where we talk about what makes a business valuable, learn the tips and tactics to increase your company's value that only veteran deal makers know. And now here's your host, Ed Misogland. Today, I had the opportunity to visit with one of my favorite people, and that's Beth Beery. Beth is... I don't even know how to describe her without saying she just totally kicks butt. She is, she is one of those people that, that is in an industry where she has her fingers on the pulse of what's going on. She knows so many people and everyone talks to her and she's in for this episode, we're talking about turf. We're talking about the grass and topical topical treatments for it and everything related to turf. I love visiting with her because she, regardless of how much experience I might bring to my deal space, she just totally buries me when it comes to all of the recon that she has in her space. And together, I think we had um, such a good conversation and it had so much value to it. And I, I, I'm well into, to 90 episodes of this podcast. And I, I could only wish that each and every one had as much value as she and I brought today. So Beth is vice president of, of turf and, and ornamental with advanced turf solutions based out of here in Indianapolis. And she's also, and you should be a subscriber too. She's also has her own podcast, um, ahead of the curb. And she is every bit and more the person you should probably be listening to, too, if you're in this industry, because she has such a wealth of knowledge. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Beth Beery. Beth Beery, welcome to the show. I am so excited to be here today, Ed. Well, I am excited to have you. You know, before you came on, I I did a probably a horrible job of in of kind of introducing you and what you what you've been, where you came from and where you are now. But uh I guess it would probably be best if it came from you. So can you give just a brief overview on you? No, oh, just spent my entire life in the lawn care industry. Stopped by just for a minute while I was in college because uh, I was working at the mall and I wanted my Friday and Saturday nights back. And so I I started as a customer service rep and I was going to school to be a teacher. And I went, I don't really like kids, Ed. And so that wasn't going to work out well for me. Does your kids know that you don't like kids? Yeah, They know that. They're well aware. Uh, But I've uh, spent 16 years at Scott's Miracle Grow, eight years at Real Green Software, loving the technology stent. And now I'm at Advanced Turf Solutions and Fishers. Uh, and you, you also are a podcast host. Don't I do. That. Yes. I have a, a podcast on Turf Up Radio called Ahead of the Curb. And we like to talk about technology, product technology. And it's a lot of fun. You've joined me on there before. I have. And I will have a link in the show notes. Um, When you say turf, what all does turf mean in your world? There's about eight categories, but chemical turf care is the area I've been involved in the longest. So if you think about True Green or Chemlon, the folks that come out and fertilize your lawn, it would include that, but also landscape maintenance. So anybody that mows uh, the Drury Inn down the street or landscape design build, putting in a backyard kitchen. Uh, snow and ice melt, irrigation, exterior pest control like mosquito. That's a big area that we focus on. Um, And then some actually go into, there's about a 30% mix of those of us in the green industry that actually go inside the home for interior pest control as well. I got it. So when, when we last visited, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes on in, in your industry and and it's, and I don't think there there is that level of activity um, in all industry, you know, I because I think you have your micro businesses that then you get a little bit bigger and and the the micros get get eaten up a little bit by the the midsize. And then you start turning into a bigger business. I guess 
what I'm looking for is I wanted to see, you know, what's the over, kind of the state of the industry and the activity that's going on. Cause I know we're coming to the end of the season. People are, you know, a lot of activity will start happening here in anticipation of 24. So I'm just trying to, to kind of gauge, you know, cost capitals up. I'm just wondering where we're, where are we today in, in the industry? It's like nobody in the green industry understands that the cost of capital is up, Ed, because it's still a frenzied pace for um, acquisition. And of those sub verticals in the green industry and in the turf industry, the ones that are garnering the most attention are those with the recurring revenue. So if I'm doing a backyard kitchen for you and I've got to go resell that $30,000 job each time, that's yeah. not as an attractive acquisition target as say someone with two to $5 million worth of recurring revenue that I know yeah. um, is going to stay in the mix. And so there's our big events for the green industry are coming up in September and October. We'll have elevate in Dallas and then equip in Louisville. And it's fascinating at the, at the host hotels, just to look at all the private equity activity in the lobbies, uh, the, the coffee shops and the bars of the big players that are out there talking to these companies. And, and what are they talking about? I mean, when, when, cause I know you've been privy to some of those conversations when, when someone approaches you, you know, what, and this is a question from, you know, down the list, but you know, what, what are they opening with? What are they, are they just solely focused on buying revenue and contracts or what are they talking about? Well, what do you think a real estate agent would say to you and Jen if they stopped by your front door? They are cold uh, calling. What do you sure. think? They're, they're yeah, no, no, they're, 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 you know, are we interested in selling a house? I get it. Are you, but yeah. not even that they'll say, do you know what this house is worth? What do, or you, that, do you have right? any idea? You know, like they yeah. want you to start thinking about because if you bought the house 20 years ago for 130,000 and some blessed, it, it's worth 375,000 today. Um, and so they want to start uh, having the conversation about, do you even realize what this asset is worth? And so last year at the show, uh, a buddy of mine, Rob Palmer from uh, Weed Pro, I, I bump into him and, and I said, hey, there's a lot of private equity guys here. And he goes, oh, well, my business is not for sale. But I've signed 12 NDAs this, this week just to talk yeah. about it. Um, by the way, he sold very successfully, not far after that. But imagine uh, 10 months ago, we're at a trade show and he's like, I had no intention of selling. But someone's knocking on the door with this pile of money. And many in the green industry, for one reason that you noted, the cost of capital feel like the market. Maybe it's up here right now. So mm -hmm. if I had any inkling, uh, maybe I don't have a, a lot of times there's a legacy handoff in the organization, but if my children or a business partner aren't interested in taking this over, I should really sit back and consider what this is worth and at least sign the NDAs and begin to understand what the process is like. But this is where I had reached out to you originally because these guys, these friends of mine, these uh, very astute business guys, they don't understand m &A. So they'll sign NDAs and even some preliminary um, letters of interest, if you will, not understanding what some of the downstream impacts of that are. And I would say in the green industry, there aren't any trusted resources to really guide those sellers through the process. It's the buyers, and these are the big private equity yeah. companies. And I'm not suggesting they're taking advantage of, but I can tell you, my friends and I are not well-versed in private equity and, and how that all works. No, I, I understand. I, and I do understand. I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, is what is motivating the consolidation or why is private equity chasing that? And, That's a great question. And, 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 and so, you know, we see, we see it. I, I just, it, it's not as clear, you know, um, it, it, yeah, it's just not as clear. So, I mean, what, what do you, how do you theorize well, why, why they're chasing it? I would say um, for the last 40 years in the industry, there's really only been one big player. For a while, it was Chemlon, and then it was True Green Chemlon when they merged, and it's been True Green ever since. And for 
until 2019, True Green was essentially the only buyer. So they were acquiring and they could pretty much name their price because if you want it out of the business, my buddy Jerry Solom was going to be the one to buy it. And at whatever multiple they were paying at the time, and that depended on your geography and your retention. And they were the only player. In 2019, it really started to pick up from some of the bigger private equity companies. And White Oak put out a study in conjunction with Principium in uh, 2019 talking about how it was really unnatural that there was no number two lawn care company. So for a short while, 16 years, Scott's Lawn Service, of which I was uh, a founding member of that team, um, we were the number two, but a very distant number two, if you will. And then True Green acquired us. But I think these private equity companies think if they can consolidate in mass, you should be able to compete against True Green, who really is considered the Walmart of the industry. Um, depending on what city you're in, they do a fantastic job, but they're the great value brand, if you will. True. And these private equity companies think with the right amount of acquisition, we can really go after True Green and be the number two player. So do they really want to be number two or do they want number one to buy out number two, add some critical mass and then and then basically build themselves as the target for number two? That oh. is, uh, that's a great question. So number yeah. one is owned by Clayton Dubier-Rice and they've owned them for a very long time. And I think they were spinning off enough profit. They're publicly traded. And I think they were spinning off enough profit at the time that it was worth keeping. So they had Hertz and Sally yeah. Beauty in their portfolio. But um, the word on the street is they're getting a little bit bored with True Green. And so it would mm. not surprise me for them to be spun off and um, maybe other, others acquired with it. So, so what makes, what makes a turf business um, what makes it palatable, uh, you know, palatable from the standpoint of, of private equity? Because I'm certain everybody that's listening to this, whether they have 50,000 in, in revenue or 50 million, now they think private equity is, is, is their solution. So what, what is that avatar? Um, restate that question. Yeah. So if, if I'm, so for the listeners and, and, and they, you know, my listeners vary from you know your micro businesses to 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 your small and lower middle market businesses. They're probably listening, and we're and you and I are sitting here going, yeah, there is a there's an opportunity for private equity to to pick you up, and even the even the smallest guy is sitting there going, wow, you know, can you imagine if there's this pile of money that Beth just was talking about? Can you fathom? how much they're willing to pay for, you know, my, you know, $50,000 in revenue, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, right. and so, so I'm trying to figure out what, what is it? And I know you said it was recurring revenue, but is, but where is, where is, there's a threshold in size. There has there, to be. A there is. And it's about it's 2 just million. A, I'd say it's 2 million is. Million. The, Yeah. uh, For most of the private equity companies that I talk to, that's the minimum target that they're looking for. Two million in in revenue or two million in EBITDA? Two million in revenue. Uh, I've seen a couple smaller ones acquired if strategically they fit into a geographic area where they're looking for a target to grow. So for a for a smaller outfits banding together and and, you know, building or, you know, that the, there should be, I, in fact, I know that there will be a number of, of turf businesses that come on the market in the next six months. It always happens. I'd be curious to, to see what, how, um, if someone could come along, you know, buy three or four of them, bundle them together and then flip it into private equity. And then that Delta between what they paid and what private equity likely would pay mm-hmm. if they can, if they can, you know, profit from that sale. I, I just, I just wonder, you know, now on the, uh, on making them targets, I mean, do the recurring revenue doesn't matter whether it's commercial or residential. I would say residential is more attractive right now. Basically 
it's tied to really? the commercial real estate market. So there's so much volatility there. Right. And we're seeing constrained maintenance budgets, even on those uh, commercial properties that are still viable. The big yeah. companies, Yellowstone, they're out trying to acquire smaller companies as well. But that created quite a hiccup in the commercial space, just the volatility of, of real estate. But what makes the companies most attractive, we're finding um, two, two companies that just do a fantastic job. Um, one is a good friend of mine, Mike Kravitsky at Grasshopper, and then uh, Rick Rittenauer at Custom Lawns. They were acquired by HCI Principal within the last couple of months. HCI Principal's based in Washington, D.C., and they they uh, state that they're a lower middle market private equity firm. They've never been in the uh, residential services space, so this is new to them. They've mm -hmm. got like um, aerospace. It's really an interesting portfolio about why they would pursue this, but the companies that they are targeting have very high residential retention. And so we're talking standouts in this area. Let's say the industry average is about 70% retention on residential accounts. And the companies that they're acquiring are around 85 to 90% retention. Those companies also have lower service calls. So lower defect ratings, if you will. And um, they invest in people, they invest in programs and equipment. So it's, it's a much higher level. Then there's others that are going after really competing with True Green on the lower end. Like even if they have a 70% retention rate, you know, maybe they'll fit into the value portfolio. But uh, GD, GTCR and HCI are the ones that are really going after the top tier companies. So when as we as as we talk about that, the the one thing that sticks out is does the um, is turf care a disposable income expense? You know what I mean? And that that's my first thing. And then there's, it's interesting that, you know, some of, some of my, some of my neighbors are starting to retire and, you know, the first thing that went was turf care. You know, I can do I, it. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, yeah. I, what I'm, what I'm saying is you you look at an aging population I, because my my industry research says you know what it's it turf care is about time it's not about your grass and that's that's the real that's the real thing for me is that or the real telling thing for me that I'm looking at you know you got I, I'm just wondering if there's a little bit of a hiccup with with the with the folks that from from the standpoint of, you know, you know, I got to tighten down because interest rates are high. My home equity loan is through the roof because it's on a variable rate. I I worry about that. And then you have your aging, you know, the those folks that move from, you know, the working population into a fixed income situation. So I'm curious that that was that was the point of that is, you know, is anybody reading the tea leaves saying, oh, man, we, we there may be a little bump, speed bump coming up here. No, well, Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> I would say if I go back to 2008, two things. One, if I go back to 2008, uh, lawn care is fairly recession proof. What we did find then at Scott's Lawn Service is that consumers would maybe buy the value program. They don't want to get kicked mm -hmm. out of the neighborhood. They don't want a letter from the HOA, <laughs> but they also aren't going to buy the deluxe program with nine treatments. And so a little bit of pullback. Um, Certainly those big design build companies that are doing the $50,000 pizza kitchens by your pool, those are starting to see a hit. Uh, Goalzilla, some of the big high-end outdoor um, oh, yeah. companies are just now starting to see some of that. And even in chemical turf care, aeration overseeding, some of the big ticket items are seeing a little bit of a pullback right now. But if you go to um, stop by Costco, or Home Depot or Lowe's ad and just look at it, what the cost of a bag of fertilizer is. And, and I sell it wholesale, right? So yeah. um, you can't do your lawn less expensively than what you could call True Green or Lawn Pride to come do it in Indianapolis. And so, and that's really been a difference lately is that you can have it done 
for about the same price or less, and you don't have to store it. So I worked at Scott's Miracle Grow for 16 years. And when we first started the do it for you market, the big box stores were coming after Scott saying, we don't like this. You're going to cannibalize what we're selling in the big box stores with the do it for you um, business. And what we found is there were two segments of people, those who enjoy being out on the lawn and doing it themselves, even if it cost them $10 more, they enjoy a yeah. Sunday or Saturday afternoon doing it and knowing that they uh, reap the rewards of that. And then there are those who like never want to open a, a bag of fertilizer and it's like water softener salt and it's too heavy. And, um, but I will say what, what piqued my interest in the way you position this is baby boomers have been a tremendous segment of this industry and they have been mm -hmm. among the biggest spenders. And you're right. My uh, baby boomer friends are retiring in mass. And maybe they're constricting the budget or a lot of them are downsizing homes. They're moving to condos. And so that could have a downstream impact on it. Well, I don't know. As I, as it, it took, you know, roughly five minutes to get the question out. I was, I was sitting there thinking that, you know, for me, it's, it's about, like I said, it's about time. Those, those yeah. of, those of us that are in the hammer down you know, period of your career. I don't want, I don't want to mess with this. I, 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 I haven't, I haven't yield yielded cutting my grass because you know, that's how I, I, I listen to my, my, uh, audio books, but as far as other turf care and stuff like that, I'm that that's not for me. And so I do believe that there's that time component and you are right. I, it was, um, I think I saw it was like sixty dollars for it, it. In fact, the bag was more expensive than my treatment. My treatment, yeah. I think, is fifty-seven, and I would have needed, I think, a bag and a half. So, I mean, you, you, but therein lies the problem. You needed a bag and a third, probably, right. and the next right. time you needed this, and now all of a sudden you're storing chemicals in the garage, and that's where most people finally come back to. Yeah, I think I'll just have them call and do it. Yeah, no, and, and it's it's been great that, but I I do I do wonder, and, and I, and I I share that, I I share the that sentiment only from the standpoint of I I fear, I fear for the the small business owner that that someone says says that to them on the buy I can't pay you because this is what's in the tea leaves and I think I think by us working through that. That's not really a problem, you know. It, it there may be a short term hit cost of capital, and and you're going to have attrition, but I don't think it's going to to be more than the thirty percent you had originally mentioned. I I just don't see that. So moving to deals, um, I know multiples are all all over depending on who the buyer is, and and private equity especially. Um, are are you seeing? It seems as though there's a big gap, like the big gap from the micro to the midsize, you know, so the, the target's there. And then from 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 the private equity up, it's it's you know, it's who's who can make the most attractive offer. And and again, highest price may not be the best offer and yeah, you know, all those all those kinds of things. So what from a value standpoint, what are you seeing in those in those little silos there? What's been fascinating to me is not that the guys that have sold the business didn't read the fine print, but when they talk about the multiples, three, I got 3x revenue. Well, you got 3x revenue, but 70% of it is a five-year holdback, or it has other asterisks yeah. tied to it. So one to 3x revenue, um, depending on how how tenured the business is, how big it is, what geographic area it's in, what it, what's the competitive landscape. But where it gets yeah. interesting is how much of it gets paid out and how much of it gets rolled over. Um, and that's been a, a tremendous variable. Uh, and then there's some big commercial uh, landscape buyers that are paying EBITDA. So, uh, yeah. you know, 22 times EBITDA on some of the big companies and big cities has has not been uncommon, but 
it's when you get into the the fine print, which is what you're good at, that you start to uh, figure out, oh, okay, there, there was this much of a hold back and I've got to stay on as a manager because some of these guys just want to cut and run. Like I'm done with this right. business. I want my money. Oh, well, I have to stay on for four years and the business has to achieve these benchmarks or um, I'm not going to get the three X. And, and it's interesting you say that because, because earnouts and holdbacks were predominantly a, a way to bridge value gap. All right. And that, and that has historically been it, it, the vehicle, the contingent payout. The funny thing these days, and, and this is, this is one of the, the, the nuances of, of, of doing deals is not only, I mean, it's not like you're getting a premium, that's just their mode of paying for it. So the holding period for the holdback or the earnout, I mean, it's not like it, it's not like you're, you've received a bucket of money, you know, and, and, and you're able to deploy it, whether it's stock market or whatever, literally the performance of your business is paying for their acquisition. And that, that to me, <laughs> you know, especially the more sophisticated buyers, whether we're talking private equity or, or more of the corporate buyers, the bottom line is if, if you know what you say, you know, and you say, and you are going to be able to do what you say you're going to do, you shouldn't need a a vehicle that mitigates your risk that much. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. That's that to me is is what is one of the challenges in the turf space is that I'm all about look. We have to do something from you know as as it, as it relates to attrition. You know, I, I get that that if I come in and I lose, and for whatever reason you knew something that I didn't know, and I lose fifty percent of the revenue. There should be a value penalty for it. I get that, but as a just as a as a sole means to acquire, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. One of the one of the other, I think value value things or value structure that should come into play is those those folks that have idle loans idle loans are you know those are assumable and we're seeing more and more people using that i mean it's the cheapest money out there i mean it's three and a half percent 30 year money and so so at any rate i i i share that only for for the listener's benefit is that you know when you're looking at at different types of the structures especially when you're talking the sale of of these kinds of contracts, you know, there's, there, okay. You, you may, there certainly needs to be enough down payment, you know, there, to demonstrate commitment to the deal there. You, you can get some conventional financing, SBA financing. You can get this, this, um, assumption of debt. And then, then you have, you know, how do you bridge the gap? I, again, I'm more of a value that earn out or hold back mitigates, you know, an unknown. Um, so anyway, those are, those are some of the things that I think we, that would benefit the, the turf folks. You were saying that they aren't versed in M and a, one of the things is that it, it is a, a matter of risk, but to, you know, to what's the like, I, I'll be curious to know what, if anybody has done a study on did you get your earn out? All right. Did you get it? Um, you know, that's a that, different that's animal. That's a great question. Along the lines of the financing, I got to throw this in. I talked to a guy, I was probably in May, does the deal, thinks it's a great deal. And they were going to be the platform to add other uh, lawn and landscape companies to his platform. They were going to use his business name. This was in Florida, but they determined that the business was somewhat undercapitalized Ed. And so in the fine print was part of your payout, the initial payout is going to be used as a line of credit <laughs> to grow the business. And I mean, he read it, but you know, he thought he was going to be in control of that line of credit too. So that was interesting. Well, and, and, and I don't want to say shame on him because I, I feel for people like that because I, it, seeing people preyed on it, it, the unsuspecting. 
I mean, and I, I, I think I may have told you when I, when I hung out with you earlier that, you know, a typical buyer sees roughly a hundred deals. So they have a hundred reps looking at deals that, and this is, you know, our industry does some, some, some work on, 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 you know, just buyer activity. So roughly a hundred, you have a hundred opportunities to look at the business. You make seven offers to get one deal. So when that business owner, man, that business owner is so, so terribly uh, outgunned when they start thinking about selling. And that's a perfect example that somebody, there should have been a deal team around that guy. Yeah. Whether it's a, a broker, M&A, attorney, accountant, somebody with some deal experience could have said, yeah, that's just atypical. Um, yeah. So, so at any rate, that's, that's, I'm, I'm sorry for him. Cause it, you know, that, that's a family behind that, that deal, you know, and yeah. But that, so that you that, think that, that probably, is atypical. I certainly hadn't heard of yeah. that, but uh-uh. no, it's, yeah, it, it's not, that's, that's not a, that's, I, I haven't, I've, I've seen a number of deals where they recapitalize, you know, where, you know, you get, you know, the, the proverbial second bite of the apple, you know, let's, you know, you throw in your, you know, your 20%, I'll throw in my 80% and this will be the, the asset going forward. Um, I, I, I would have to say 50% maybe work out the way it should. I mean, it it just, it depends on the business. It depends yeah. on, you know, when you, you know, your mom and pops that make that $2 million in, in revenue or $5 million. And, you know, it's just a family business. They don't necessarily have systems and all the things that private equity comes along and brings. They've made a totally kick butt business and, and, but, but they aren't sophisticated. So when they go to exit, it all of a sudden the the level of sophistication that comes down on top of them just you know just buries them and you know they, they may they they tend to make a, a bad deal or not make the best deal. You know what I mean? I do. Um so I wanted to ask you are, are you I know we were just talking structures. Are you seeing any Anything that's standing out other than earnouts and holdbacks besides that? One, one interesting um, asterisk is whether or not the founder stays in the leadership team. And in some cases, it's part and parcel to the deal happening. And in others, it's optional um, and how long they stay and what their role is. Uh, that, really? That's garnering a lot of a- attention right now. So, um, But why? Why would, why would that be the case? Because, would, and, and yeah, why would you need the owner? And, and here's what, here's why I'm asking, you know, you're talking, you're talking topical treatments and things. I don't, I, I am the people that do my lawn. I mean, there's a guy that does it. I, I don't, I don't, I don't have any affiliation or, or, um, you know, person, there's no personal goodwill with that guy and me other than right. the guy shows up and. So why, why do I need, why do I need that owner if I'm just buying contracts? It's the guy who does your lawn is a registered technician. And so if there's significant okay. employee turnover, then they don't have enough registered technicians to go do the lawn. That's where the attrition starts. And mm-hmm. so I think I thought is if the founder stays, we can preserve the culture and preserve the the retention of employees, which is starting to get a little bit easier to get registered technicians. But the last three years, we are severely understaffed in the industry. That's interesting you say that. And and you're not the first industry that that I've heard that. But it is the first industry or the first time I have heard culture with 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 the turf community. And and shame on shame on me. I mean, you because and and again I it I think there is a, you know, there's a predisposition that, you know, look, these guys are just labor guys that, you know, come in, they suit up, get their, you know, load up the truck and away they go. And there's not much more, you know, it, there's not much more to it. And I think that there, 
what you're saying is that, you know what, if you want to make your business attractive, you've got to have some culture, you've got to have some stickiness to why somebody wants to work with you. And then how are we going to sell that to the next guy? You yeah. Know, it's, it's been interesting though. I had dinner with a buddy last month in Maryland and I thought he's going to be the worst employee of all time because he hasn't had a boss his entire life. And he's kind of appreciating being part of something bigger. As he said, people who are smarter than me um, that I'm learning from, but uh, it's a mixed bag of whether or not it works out when the founder sticks around. You know, it's funny. Uh, most of the time, you know, just about every deal here and, and we've done about 2200 of them and the funny thing is that <laughs> boat you know there's a there's a transition period and we want the owner we want the owner we want the owner until the owner stays and and then it's like yeah i'm not certain we we totally need you anymore yeah and 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 part of it has to do with you know sucking out the you know, the, you know, the IP that that owner has, you know, of this business. But, but a lot of the challenge comes to allegiance. You know, you have a new owner, you know, who do you listen to? The guy that you've been working with for 20 years or this new guy that probably has, you know, some, some knowledge of the industry, but no knowledge of their business, you know? And I think that that creates a little bit of a challenge. But, and I think it's interesting when you look at the brand equity that might be tied to that owner. So, uh, yeah, a buddy of mine in Dayton, Zeller Landscape, it's their last name. And some companies are specifically not building a brand around their name because they know they want to sell it one day. And if, if Andrew Zeller goes away, is it really still Zeller's landscape? But, um, when I was at Scott's Lawn Service, we did 158 acquisitions during a very short period of time. And we had wow. a, a logo that was as old as Abraham Lincoln. And we thought, Ed, it didn't matter. We were paying one and a half to three times revenue. And we would send the, the founder down the road with his check. And we'd put new logos on the trucks. And we'd just show up at your house next week. And you used to be served by Andrew's Lawn Care. And now it's Scott's Lawn Service. And they viewed that as a big corporate brand. And yeah. the acquisition integration strategy was not that great. And I'm not sure that some of these big private equity companies didn't learn from what we do. And so, you know, in yeah. order to run it on scale... A great example is Xperia Green. They're a very fast growing um, company in the green industry and they're led by practitioners in the industry and uh, not by bank people. And so they do a great job, but they're going to change the name of the company to Xperia Green because that's how you run it on scale. So it's a, a delicate yeah. balance of how quickly you do that, you change the logos on the trucks. What do you tell the customer? What's the best of both worlds is if that founder retains some of the equity so that they can actually say we're still locally owned and operated because that means uh, a lot to, to yeah, folks. Yeah. So you were talking about, and I just have a couple more questions that you were talking about, you know, you guys were paying between one and a half and three. What made a, what made someone pay a three? What would, were there any particular attributes that you can, that yeah. you, say, you know, if it has this, this, and this, it was typically for us at Scott's where we wanted to be in a geographic area. So we knew if we had a greenfield start where we just started mailing out direct mail and knocking on doors, how long it would take us to get going. Yeah. Whereas if we did a decent acquisition, so we were looking to grow in Boston, Massachusetts. It's a great lawn care market, but yeah. we really needed a significant size to get started. Uh, the flywheel effect, if you will, was, was much greater yeah. with, an acquisition. So that's where we would pay three X. If we wanted to bolt on in Indianapolis okay. where we had an established base, that's where you're looking at 1.5. And you think it's, I, I, I have to suspect that it's probably still the case that, that, yeah, that when you're so. buying market share, that's, that's a premium. Yes. I got it. All right. My, my, my last question I ask everybody is, you know, if you had one piece of advice that you could give your, your, your turf brethren, what what would it be to to have the greatest impact on their business that makes them saleable in the future? Take care of the customer and know that you're taking care of the customer. 
okay. because especially in our industry, most of the time you just said you, you outsource it. You don't know when that guy is at your lawn, right? You don't know if he does the front lawn or the back lawn. So there's some technology aspects that we're working on with steel green equipment right now so that after that turf guy visited your lawn, he would email you the invoice and it would also show with GPS tracking exactly where he went on your lawn and that he went behind oh, the wow. barn. And yeah. that's the number one reason why we lose trust with customers. We're partnering with Mother Nature. So yeah. can we promise yeah. you a weed-free lawn? We cannot, Ed. Um, but when you get weeds behind the barn, the first thing you're going to think is the guy's not going behind the barn. You didn't notice that, oh, there's actually a yeah. lot of concrete there. And so um, providing yeah, proof of service and following up with uh, a lot of customer feedback and ensuring that you're taking care of the customer, that builds trust and that builds retention. Agreed. That's a that's a good one. Um, I didn't realize that there was that kind of technology coming down. There's about to be. There's about to be. No. Nice. So what's the best way we can connect with you? Well, I would love to connect with your listeners. I love what you do here. And I can tell you in the green industry, there's not a lot of folks like you that are out there educating uh, green industry folks when they enter into the M&A process. So just some quick conversations you and I have had as a side. They, they get to these shows or they answer the phone, they start signing um, NDAs and they're really looking at top line numbers. So I, I'm anxious to have you enter our space. But if you want to get a hold of me and I can connect you with that, it's bberry at advancedturf.com or I'm on Turf Sep Radio ahead of the curb with Beth Berry every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Well, Beth Berry, I'm I know we had to we had to cancel our first one and we were we were tentative on this one. I'm glad that uh your your voice held up. You sound yes, great, and I, I just, feel great. It it's <laughs> well. It is it is always great to see you and great to visit with you. And and you're you're such a you're so much fun to talk to. So well, thanks for I being value with me. what you bring to the industry. So keep doing what you're doing. Yes, ma'am. I'll do it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. This was another episode of the Defenders of Business Value Podcast. For more episodes packed with strategies to increase the value of your business, visit DefendersOfBusinessValue.com for show notes, transcripts, and free tools to start you on your journey. Subscribe now so you don't miss any future episodes.